The Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Now large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to wage war against another king will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot then, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You're invited to be seated. Grace to you and peace, peace, peace from God our Creator through Christ Jesus, who feeds us God's love and the Holy Spirit who guides our choices. When I was young, I remember being told we don't hate. So every time we use the word, we either got a request to rephrase or a very stern look, or we were punished. My siblings and I got really good at, at using dislike very much <laughs> instead of hate or, or counting the cost for punishment because it, it seemed worth it to release our anger with a well-placed, I hate you. When I read passages like this one from Luke, I realize we, the six Landis siblings, missed out by being raised as relatively biblically illiterate Lutherans. How great it would have been to be able to say, but Jesus told us to hate or when my parents were ready to ground me for the millionth time for disrespecting or disobeying them, I could have said, but I'm just following Jesus' teachings to hate father and mother. Do you think that would have worked? <laughs> no, no, there I'd go off to my room for my millionth time of being grounded. Now we laugh, but there is a lot of hate being unleashed these days. The word's getting thrown around a lot. Many of you might have read Timothy Egan's editorial entitled, Why People Hate Religion. In that, he calls out Christians' behavior as tribal, primal, and vindictive. He calls out Christian leaders as frauds. He calls out all of Christianity as being used as moral cover for despicable behavior. We might be tempted to respond to this like Pastor Leland reminded me, the brilliant musical satirist Tom Lehrer, who said, I know there are people in the world who do not love their fellow human beings, and I hate people like that. <laughs> the temptations are real. We might even think we're, we're justified to dismiss this hard teaching from Jesus, like I'm sure all of you dismissed the million times I used in my story. But Jesus' call is clarion and consistent. You can't cut costs and follow Jesus. You can't cut costs and follow Jesus. Back during the height of Christian nationalism in Germany, Dietrich Bonhoeffer had to go underground to defy the ways the Christian church failed to boldly stand up to evil people and evil systems. His brilliant book called The Cost of Discipleship, many of you, I'm sure, have read it, analyzes every facet of Jesus' seeming hyperbole 
give up all your possessions, hate your family, hate life itself? You see, Jesus, Jesus wasn't teaching the crowd about an emotional state, the one we think of when we think of children stomping their feet or adults behaving like children stomping their feet. Jesus was teaching what Mark Davis writes about, declaring one's loyalty between two options decisively. The full commitment to Jesus means the severance of that full commitment to another person, place, or thing worthy of our commitment. When you think of the countless commands and, and God's overarching message that we get from God's word to love neighbor and, and lovingly honor our family covenants, it sure seems counterproductive and confusing, doesn't it? What is Jesus asking? Right before this, Jesus was telling a parable to the crowd about all the excuses people gave for not coming to a great banquet invitation. One person said, no, I got to go care for my land. Another person said, I've got to go care for my oxen. Yet another person that was invited said, I, I have to go care for my newlywed spouse. All reasonable people, places, and things to care for. But my, my, my. So the dinner party host instead served the poor, the disabled, the blind, the weak, and anyone who was hungry, anyone who would come through the doors. The home was opened for all, no matter who because the party of enough for all wouldn't have been complete without them being there. It sounds a lot like our, our first page of our bulletin where we lift it up as we talk about how God calls us to trust our very first value as people here called together by Jesus at Grace, where we will value inviting everyone, no matter who, so hyperbole or not, Jesus asked then and Jesus keeps asking his followers now to make decisions based not on what's best for ourselves or even what's best for our family, biological, religious, or even national. Instead, Jesus calls us to choose what's best for showing all the world, especially those who are hurting, how much God's love is working in, through, and with them and us. In our very first reading, Paul lovingly reminds a, a Jesus follower that it means voluntarily violating the strict Roman household codes. Those were the rules of the day that everyone followed as a matter of survival. And this follower of Jesus, Paul boldly and hopefully declared, would not just free a slave, but choose to receive him back into his household as a brother. That was long ago. Just this summer, Another example, we had our fifth and sixth graders that, that come together during VBS and are, and are called the service crew. They spent time volunteering and learning about the Head Start program. Molly and others spent their time when they went to visit a Head Start program, helping the teachers, being with the kids, eating with the children, playing with them. Many of our kids, I admit it, started out with negative stereotypes that they'd been taught or that they'd taken from the media about the poor. But Molly and others saw that these kids were loving and kind and fun and so thankful. So inspired by getting to know the children and seeing their needs up close, Molly chose after VBS, when it was time for her to have a birthday party, to not receive birthday gifts, 
but to invite all her friends to bring donations for the Head Start program, the very program she had been a part of. Lest you think it's only through children's eyes that we see that kind of sacrifice, there was a story that recently came out about a, a, a retired NFL player by the name of Rick DeMulling. He was living the good life. He lived on seven acres in a suburb of Indianapolis with his wife and his three kids, all under the age of eight. Yet due to their deeper walk of faith, they've decided to sell their dream property and move to Indy's near east side, one of the most crime-ridden, and yes, one of the most unemployed groups of pl places where the most unemployed live. When he was asked why, he says, why wouldn't we? Others describe him as a dude who follows his heart, but he admits he doesn't fully know what awaits him. And he's quick to remind others what it's really about. He says it's just to be a good neighbor. We're not going there to be a savior by any means or go there to try to change the world. We're just going there to be a good neighbor. We don't really have a plan. Whatever door God opens, we'll try to go through it. Now, in case you, you think these choices are some great bargain with God or a, a trade-off or some reward on earth as in heaven, Bonhoeffer reminds us of yet another way hatred shows up when it comes to following Jesus. He says the messengers of Jesus will be hated to the end of time. They will be blamed for all the division which rends cities and homes. Jesus and his disciples will be condemned on all sides for undermining family life and for leading the nation astray. They will be called crazy fanatics and disturbers of the peace. We use our discipling hands, our feet, our hearts, our voices, our possessions, yes, our lives, not to establish a community of the perfect, Bonhoeffer says, but a community consisting of human beings who really live under the forgiving mercy of God. Discipleship is not something we offer up to Jesus, but Jesus makes it possible through the centrality of God's never failing and living love that keeps coming to us. Living love that not only picked up a cross, but died on it. Living love that death could not contain. Living love that keeps discipling us every time we eat together at God's feast of forgiveness. Every time we take in that forgiveness and it strengthens our faith. Living love that helps us make cross-centered choices in our individual and our collective lives that show just how much we trust God and God's love through us. Living love that makes a way out of what seems to be no way. Now I know you can dismiss the story of the little girl because she of course came from a home where all her needs were being met and you, you can dismiss the story of a, of a person who served seven years in the NFL and I'm sure had quite the next, next egg that allowed him the freedom to make that choice. But as I was walking along thinking about that and whether to even use those stories, I was, I was walking along near the railroad tracks going to meet someone at the Grapevine restaurant. And everywhere I looked was concrete. And if I hadn't been kind of worried about how, how hard my feet were not working in my shoes, I probably wouldn't have looked down. But there it was. In the place where it seemed like nothing possibly could live was a little petunia that had just come out from the place where the, the end of the building and the, the sidewalk came right there. Nothing else was around, though. I looked up thinking, oh, gosh, yeah, there must have been a basket or, or something, other decoration. Nothing was around. There were no live plants around. I had to walk a few more feet and turn the corner to be able to see there in a basket were the same colored flowers. You just never know how the Holy Spirit might move and plant and allow something to grow and blossom where it seems like nothing ever could come about. 
You see, it's not always clear, it's not always calm, it's not always contained in what we can comprehend. Again, Bonhoeffer reminds us, God says discipleship is not limited to what we can com comprehend. It must transcend all comprehension. Bewilderment is the true comprehension. Not to know where you are going is the true knowledge. Oh, that's so hard. God's comprehension transcends ours. And so we return to what often seems like this daily battle between the temptations to the security of being self-centered and the chaos through the uncertainty of, of being Christ-centered. Our Lutheran understanding of, of who we are in these tensions, simul justus et peccator, simultaneously saint and sinner at all times, is similar to what a wise Cherokee elder taught her granddaughter about life. She said, a fight is going on inside of me. It's a terrible fight and it is between two wolves. One is evil, anger, envy, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, and ego. But she continued, she said, the other is good, joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. The same fight is going on inside you, Grandma said, and inside every other person too. And the granddaughter thought about it for a moment and then she asked her grandma, which wolf will win? And the old Cherokee woman simply replied, the one you feed. Thanks be to God for the one who feeds us, who keeps discipling us, and is worthy of our full and undivided trust.